I'm now going to um, cut off all of these very talkative and opinionated people. Thank you. <laughs> And ask if you all you have any questions you'd like to pose to our panelists. And I believe we have the staff with microphones. No, you need said to we go will, to the microphone. We will ask that you go to the microphone or have the microphone come to you. Otherwise, to uh, your you. question is not recorded and it does not and the answer will not make sense. <laughs> if we have any questioners here. Yeah, they're lining up at the mic. Oh, okay, I see. Thank they you. They have to go to the mic. I couldn't see the light. Is this on? Okay. Um, the United States has been having a bout of late of want, trying to export constitutional democracy to other countries. And the results have shown a lack of understanding on our part of other cultures. But I'm wondering if it also shows a lack of understanding on our part of the uniqueness of our Constitution and that it's taken over 200 years and we're still trying to get it right. Well, it's, it's interesting that almost no other country is adopted. All sorts of Americans go over and consult with people building constitutions in these countries. And almost never, none of these countries have developed a system like ours. They've developed parliamentary systems. Why is that? Interesting. Why? Well, it, it, parliamentary are uh, uh, more, more efficient. But what they have adopted, though, is the sense of inalienable rights. And I think that part is universal. I, the idea, I mean, in fact, what's interesting is that Europe sort of grabbed it and turned civil rights into human rights. But I think that's just an expansion of the American ideal. I also think you have to always keep in mind the size of this country and the diversity of this country. Uh, and in many other countries that we're dealing with, we're dealing with far more homogeneous cultures and, and far smaller spaces. And, uh, and, and in those systems, a parliamentary system is much easier to, to deal with. Okay, and I want to get more questions in. I'll go to the other side of the room now. Hi, Mike. Um, <laughs> I thought, I took your survey this week, and I thought one of the hardest questions on the survey was the one that you have on the first page here. The American constitutional system is one in which the powers of the government are limited. If it had been worded, are supposed to be limited, <laughs> the answer would have been very easy. But uh, the, the results show that uh, there is a pretty even split as to yeah. how people think on this. And I'd be interested in um, how your panel thinks. The reality is, obviously, that the federal government is in almost every aspect of uh, American life these days. Okay, have, have we lost the, the, the principle of limited government? On, on a simple level, when, when, when someone wanted to burn a Koran that was going to threaten all sorts of horrible things, the government knew it was limited. They didn't just arrest them, they didn't stop them. I think the, one of the main limits is in areas of things like religion and speech. I think in terms of criminal protections, uh, the Fourth Amendment, all of those. I think in that sense, there's a very deep sense that being an American means there are certain things your government cannot do. And, now, and what about asking you to buy health insurance? Because that's well, got to be this where is, this topic I mean, goes. This is really where you see a huge partisan split on this question. Uh, Two-thirds of Republicans and independents uh, say that the Constitution does not limit government's powers. And 45% um, of Democrats, the Democrats are pretty evenly split on it. So there's a 20-point gap between Democrats and Republicans and independents agree with Republicans on this. Again, I think we're operating in the context of the debates of today. So that people who feel that the health care plan has gone too far, or feel that the, the bank regulation has gone too far, or feel that the stimulus package was too much government intervention, um, you know, think that the Constitution uh, does not limit government powers enough. People who think those were good ideas disagree. So, you know, it's one of those things of, of where you sit depends on where you stand. Okay. I'll go to the other side of the room for the next question. I've asked for 15 years, and it took me five years to realize the answer. What, what is the most important <clears throat> title a person or persons can have under the U.S. Constitution, and what is that title? There is none. Unless you go citizen. Yeah. Uh, Unless you go Chuck, citizen. Chuck, what would you go with? Well, Truman said citizen. I go with it. Okay. I, I totally agree. I mean, I'd say there's none. There is no title. Okay. Well, but <laughs> I'll, I'll go with citizen, too. <laughs> Along with popular sovereignty. Okay, we've dealt with I'm that a, one. I'm a public school teacher, and what really concerns me is that the younger people aren't voting. Um, I'm also uh, 
Vietnam era veteran, and when I was uh, when I was 19 or 20, uh, it was an important vote. It was something that mattered to me. Are there any really? And I'm constantly bombarded being a union member of the teachers union as well as AARP. And whether I agree with them or not, at least I'm aware of the issues. And if I don't agree with them, I vote one side. If I agree with them, I vote that other side. Are there any issues that are really important to young people today that will galvanize them and get them to vote? I mean, if we brought back the draft. That would do it. I, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, I, and I agree with that. And maybe that would be a good thing to do is at least have that brought up. Are there any, are there any issues that will galvanize young people to take an interest in voting. One that should is college tuition. Or college loans. College loans, college tuition, the cost of textbooks for college, my God. And, and so jobs, just, right now, I mean, I think what, yeah, what, I think what surprised the Democrats is that jobs became things that young people really cared about when they, when they couldn't get them after graduating college. And I think employment, I think issues of privacy as well. I think gay rights kind of issues, which to a younger generation are no-brainers. I think when they, if they saw that being the, the trend going the other way, I think you'd see a lot of galvanized kids. But are you seeing the, are you seeing those kids voting now? Are you do you expect them to vote in the elections? I, I certainly don't expect them to vote in midterms. Um, it's hard to get anybody to vote in midterms. But the um, um, but it, in the last election, as I said earlier, they, their their participation was up. But um, there's no sort of galvanizing issue that, that people are, are getting to them on. And there's been a lot of effort. Rock the vote and all of that. There's been, and the Obama campaign, I mean, the genius of that campaign with young people was the method of communication. You know, everybody who walked into Invesco Field in Denver, the purpose of that rally was mainly to get everybody's cell phone downloads. And, uh, and so that, you know, for, yeah. no, seriously, so that for weeks before registration closed in any state, you'd get a text message, go register, and, uh, and then get out the vote messages all on your cell phone. And, um, and that, that was effective um, to the degree that, you know, more young people did participate uh, than we have seen in previous elections. There is one other I think possibility, we're also oh, oh, just, that you have the, uh, the John Stewart, Stephen Colbert rally. Yeah, and I think to get, and I, but I, 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 think, I think doing it, uh, I think snark the vote is probably the way to go. That if you got people to sort of, dish, not to, to both take it seriously and not take it seriously simultaneously, is probably how you reach young people. See, but I, I mean, I my guess about those way. rallies is that right. the, the people will show up, but it won't galvanize and, and I also think that, that the survey does tell us that even if the, the, the voting isn't the only mark of citizenship, it's an engaged citizenry, but it's also one that understands some of these founding principles. And on that score, I think we can be heartened. Uh, let's take a question from this side. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you guys uh, surveyed on the, on the Second Amendment or not as part of the no. your Constitution. That was, didn't not, do any of that was not part of the survey. Well, well then perhaps I, let me ask the question and see how you would, you would answer this. It seems that. There, there's a lot of problems in terms of, of how um, people interpret just or, or have knowledge of just pieces of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. So, for example, if you ask people in the United States about the Second Amendment, a lot would say about infringement, bear, you know, right to bear arms, but not much about militia. And at the same rate, a lot of people wouldn't be able to understand. They might be able to say what the words say, but not understand or be able to explain why what the debate was that put it in there in the first particular case. So um, my question to you is, is taking the, the Second Amendment as an example. We know the results in your survey are, is pretty appalling for us as Americans trying to support democracy and all. And we can say that, OK, well, it's our education system that's the problem. But that's only a very short time that we actually get to educate kids. Can I ask you to get to your question? Yeah, so, so, so my question is, is what, what is the next steps? Now that you have the results, how do we solve this issue in terms of having people know, you know, the, the, what the Constitution says, how it was put together, okay. rather than just the words itself? Okay. I, in terms of the Second Amendment, which was just recently decided, and, and uh, okay. a right of individual right to, to, to self-defense, as it were, I think if you look at the Supreme Court case, you had you know, nine justices looking at history and coming up with different solutions and different understandings. But I think that what's really important, the take home message is the more you know the history, the smarter you can be and the more you can participate. There wasn't an obvious slam dunk answer. It was a very close vote, but I think it was a legitimately close vote. I think it was a leg legitimately close question. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I do think that, um, that um, you, you made a good point about the more you know, the better answer you get. I, I think all of us are saying that we, the, it's a different world than when the founders wrote the Constitution, but we make a more informed understanding of how to apply and interpret the Constitution today if we start with an understanding of the issues and debates and ideas that the founders brought to, to, to forming that charter. Um, but I think next steps have to be, you know, occasions like this. I mean, just getting out, getting the word out, getting the word out to the kids, getting the word, and, the, and when you say it's just a short period of time to educate them, but it's a crucial period of time. Uh, we have a new uh, program here at the archives, Docs Teach, um, which is uh, teaching uh, through the documents. I mean, they're all, and it's fabulous. And, and we just launched it this week, right, David? And, um, and there's already been a great response. Um, there are lots of teacher programs around the country. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working on it. Uh, but you all can help work on it sure. because uh, this is something that all the citizenry uh, needs to be engaged in. What, what if we all collaborated on a guide that said, how to talk to your children about the Constitution? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the side of the room over here. What, what, what we find is the children go home and they, they uh, teach their parents uh, about the Constitution. That's fine, too. That's uh, a good but, thing. Yeah. Okay. But the Second Amendment is obviously something that, as an educator, uh, that's, that's a hot issue. And we get, uh, th that's one of the few areas where we get uh, inquiring letters. We have, un unfortunately, our book on the Constitution, we didn't put in the, although it was a treatment of the Second Amendment in the body of the text, it was not in the index. So we learned about a lot of people in the country who care about the Second Amendment. <laughs> I want to get some more questions in. I'll go to the other right side of my right side of the room. Uh, the results of the survey that I found the most disconcerting was with regards to young, uh, younger people wanting to have a new constitution. Uh, my question is, what recommend recommendations do you have of w ways that we can better use the internet to improve constitutional oh, literacy of the digital of the digital generation? Good point. How do we use the internet to educate about the Constitution? Docs teach. <laughs> That's all on the internet. <laughs> the amount of information that is now available on the internet is absolutely astounding. Uh, it is. You know, if you, uh, after you finish Docs teach, you go to Google Books, and you can start finding out just, just the histories, and, and it's, it's really getting, using the internet to link to the information that is now available, stuff that used to be hidden in libraries and all. But she's making a very good point. She is. Any organization like Montpelier should be having a big internet educational component. Right. And we do educate nearly a thousand teachers a year of government and civics, and we uh, do provide support for those who come. But all of that should be out there too. All of that. But you're making a very good point. And to add, the internet does something else that's very important, which is it lets you leave the world of text. And I think, uh, you know, to, to think creatively about a multimedia approach rather than, I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned, I look at the documents, but I think we're missing the ability of doing an old, like when TV started and they, everyone was like an old radio show. I think we treat the internet like an old library. We're missing 90% and especially reaching the young people. And I think that's really the next step in terms of the internet. Well, not here at the archives, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll add, fortunately, there can never be too much of this kind of education. Uh, on the other side of the room. Thanks. Uh, Professor Myerson, you said that one of the uh, things that the Founding Fathers would not have envisioned were corporations. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the evolution of corporations, how they've come to have many of the same rights as a living, breathing human, um, the, the implications of that, and, and what the future of that might look like. Corporations at the time of the founding were very limited entities. The idea that they would be the engine of society was really not imagined. And even more fundamentally, the idea that they would be interstate, an international corporation selling, selling produce, was absolutely beyond the structure, the, the, the imagination. Um, the question of, of how you deal with a corporation is a really difficult one, uh, and whether or not they should have free speech rights. Uh, and without getting into that, because I, I find it's one of those many areas where I, I keep changing minds. But I'll tell you the one thing to think about, uh, about corporations having speech. Supreme Court once said, it's not a matter of who's speaking. What's valued is what's being said. And the question of increasing the amount of speech is not inherently bad. Whether or not the campaign finance law and striking it down made sense, I'm not sure. But I, I'm not so quick to say, oh, we, don't want, we only want X to be able to speak. I think the idea of more speech being better is really a, a bedrock American principle. And let me tell you something about corporations that you probably haven't thought about. Um, 
in terms of social services in this country, the creation of the original social safety net was done by women who created the orphanages and the poor houses and all that. Married women could not own property. So the only way they could buy land for an orphanage and build the building and all that was to incorporate. And so they, I mean, think of what this took. They had to go to the state legislature, or in the case of the Washington Female Orphan Asylum, to the Congress. They had to lobby. They had to be very public. They had to get out and raise funds publicly again and keep going back to the incorporating body. But those corporations were the absolute beginning of the social safety net in this country. And uh, we have all their records because they were corporations. And uh, the fact is, is that they always made sure that the treasuress was an unmarried woman, so the husband couldn't seize the assets of the corporation. <laughs> and, um, and they were very, very, very useful entities. And in fact, the women who ran those corporations, because they were dealing with so many poor people, including so many free blacks in the North, became the backbone of the abolition movement. And through their work in abolition, when they were shut out of abolition meetings because they were women, that led them to suffrage. So the two great, huge social movements that helped to perfect our union, abolition and suffrage, started in those corporations. Interesting. History has its values. <laughs> On my right. I, I want to follow up. I want to follow up on something that Mr. Quigley said, um, and that's about uh, an engaged populace. And I think that this is very, very important, and we should not forget this. The Constitution as a document and as a process, I think, is a very good one, and our panels amply demonstrated that tonight. But without an engaged, educated, and informed populace, it will become a dead letter. Is my fear. I just spent a year in a what the UN would regard as a pretty corrupt country. And um, I have a new regard for our freedom of the press and its guardianship over our rights. And I would just leave you with one of James Madison's neighbor's comments, Thomas Jefferson, about if the press is free and the people can read, then all is safe. And that is something very, very, it's, really we're, we're talking about the document, and that's a good thing tonight, and I don't <laughs> want to take away from that. But without that, the rest of the system, the people being involved and properly informed and doing work to get properly informed, not just, you know, watching whatever, you know, for five minutes before they go vote, is very, very important. Yeah, and, and, of course, that gets to the issue of what is the future of the press in our world today? And it's guardianship over the Constitution, actually. Because yeah. I noticed when I saw things in this other country, I thought, well, at home, you could call the papers. And there, there <laughs> right. no that's a good point. It's there were no papers point. to call. And well, a, well, 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 one phenomenon in our country that perhaps we don't take enough notice of is that when we vote the bums out of, out of office, they really go. <laughs> we should be grateful for that. So. Oh. Well, that's a, really, that's a really, really important point. I mean, that first, that 1800 election, uh, when, you know, you had a yep. change of parties and the loser accepted the consequences, was really the second revolution. And, um, and, and we just take it completely for granted. And, you know, John Adams snuck out of town for that inauguration. But now, there sits the defeated person on the platform with the elected mm -hmm. person. And we have a change of government, and that does, still does not happen in many places on Earth. Look what happened in the Iranian elections. Look what's happened, you know, with the uh, Zimbabwe elections. I, I thought for a while it would be a problem in the Democratic primaries last time. <laughs> but, um, the, I mean, the fact is, is that this is a remarkable thing. Okay. I know we have a lot more questions. I'll ask two more over on this side of the room. With all due respect to the genius of protecting against the uh, tyranny of the majority, uh, do you think the f uh, framers of the Constitution would want a do-over if they realized that the majority did not always elect the President of the United States? 
No. They, they, look, they, they look, want to do over. No, uh, I, I, uh, we know they wouldn't want to do over. Uh, secondly, they, look, they all knew George Washington was going to be number one. They all knew that was going to be really good. But they also knew this machine to go on forever was going to let all sorts of bizarre people. And I think they even knew that a judicial review might step in as well. I think that they would be actually quite pleased that, that we, you know, I, I think the Civil War would have upset them. But I think <laughs> that, I that where we are today would have, would have quite pleased them. I think they expected most elections to go to the House of Representatives because they didn't have set parties. So it would have, it would have been, um, it really would have been not by the majority, just on the face of it. Yeah, I think the electoral system, they were still, it was right. very experimental right. and didn't work out in, in, as quite as they thought. So over to my right. Um, speaking of things that the framers might not have seen coming, um, I know that the House of Representatives was seen sort of as the, the voice of the people the opportunity to get those hot ideas out there before they were cooled down by the Senate. Now, in the House of Representatives now, you've got one representative for roughly a million people. And I think at the founding it was 35,000. I could be wrong there. I think 50. That, I, I could very easily be wrong, but some dramatic mm -hmm. proportion. And that really changes the relationship that any citizen has with their representative, has with the person who's supposed to be you know, speaking their interests. You can't have a personal relationship with someone who's representing a million people. Is there some sort of? I think we're up to you know, about six hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, it's now. not quite. It's, it's closer to a half million than a million. But um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I may have misstated. But there. the truth is, uh, you know, I really disagree with that. Members of Congress are like the uncle you can't get away from the party. <laughs> I mean, they show up at every firehouse opening, bar mitzvah, first communion, uh, graduation. Uh, I mean, if anything, they're too in touch. But what I think actually is a problem is I think, I think the redistricting I think is dangerous because I think the ability to do, I, know, I mean obviously Patrick Henry did it as well, but the ability to do it by computer is, 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 is an efficiency that I told you efficiency scares me. Right. So I think that's what makes the representatives un, unaccountable is when they're put in what we call safe districts. I, and I and the makes founders, the polarization much worse. Yeah, and I do think the founders assumed that voters would pick their elected representative, not representative picking his voters. Right. Yes. And that exactly seems to right. be where, where we're at. No, that's right. Well, I'm, that's actually, I'm actually going to reserve the final question to myself, which is, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the panel and of the audience, does the Constitution still work? Is it the right charter as we face the challenges of a new century? Chuck? Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've already both answered it, really. <laughs> I, I, obviously, it works, you know. But I, 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 I would like to see the entire system working much better uh, than it works now. I, I'm, I'm, I would say, not disenchanted or, or cynical, but um, I think uh, that Congress is not working the way it should. Uh, there are uh, areas in which the people, uh, there's a large percentage of the people, are agreed upon certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so just for example, the field of civic education, 90-something percent of people feel it should be required. Uh, the, the U.S., there's very little support for civic education from Congress, almost no support from the, from the uh, executive branch of government. And I, I won't pick other issues that will uh, paint me into my particular <coughs> partisan place, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied. All right. I do think it's working. Uh, I think it's just, I, I mean, I keep coming back to this question of, of look who we are as a country. We are this great, big, uh, very uh, different from each other country, both in terms of our ethnicity and race and heritage, but also in terms of our resources from state to state. We have farm states and we have states with big cities where everybody eats. We have car producing states and oil producing states and states where people have too much pollution. We have all kinds of differences of interest and yet we manage to survive and, and thrive as a country. And I think it's because of this charter, this fundamental charter that has created a system that uh, uh, brings people together in that messy institution called Congress, the word means coming together. Uh, where they are forced to sit down together and, yes, make compromises that, that are there to, which is the right thing to do, which are there to try to, to help the, the majority of the people. And um, I do think it works. I would add one more thing. What makes the, the system uh, perfectible 
in many ways comes down to freedom of speech and the ability to communicate, to get together, to, to lobby and to change. Uh, I think I'm supposed to give a shout out finally to James Madison. <laughs> and one of the things to remember when you look at history is during the War of 1812, when DC is being burned, when you have secession up in Connecticut, James Madison refused to limit people's speech. He believed in it so strong. And I think to me, it, the most frightening we ever get, we should go back to that moment and realize when the nation was under attack, freedom of speech was to be preserved because that will preserve us. But he wouldn't have been reelected in 1812 were it not for Dolly Madison. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, well. um, and that is just DeWitt, uh, DeWitt Clinton was running against him. He had half the Republicans and the Federalists behind him. And James G. Blaine wrote later in the century, Mrs. Madison saved the administration of her husband, but for her, DeWitt Clinton would have been president in 1812. So. Well, Michael Koki, Chuck, thank you so much <laughs> thank for you. devoting thank you. your time as volunteers. David, my thanks again to you and the National Archives and Record Administration for, for welcoming us to your wonderful facility. My thanks to the Claude Moore Foundation. And finally, I'd like to thank you, our right. audience. Thank you for You coming. are demonstrating the kind of civic exactly engagement right. yes. that this nation is founded on. A shout out to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.